So I'm here this evening to introduce Marsha Linehan. Her list of accomplishments is both broad and long. She is a professor of psychology and of psychiatry and behavioral sciences at the University of Washington in Seattle. She is a talented therapist, researcher, and author. Dr. Linehan is also the founder and or the director of multiple organizations dedicated to helping people who struggle with suicidality and severe psychological problems. And she is a Zen master. So one would think that in order to have accomplished all of this, she would have to be a Zen master. And it's probably true. What is the sound of one hand clapping? Okay. Well, it certainly isn't the thunderous applause that greets her whenever she speaks in public. And that thunderous applause most often is about what is undoubtedly Marsha's most significant accomplishment, the development of dialectical behavior therapy, abbreviated as DBT, or as some of our clients laughingly call it when they can't actually pronounce dialectical, diabolical behavior <laughs> therapy. Originally developed as a treatment for chronic suicidality and self-injury, DBT rapidly became an effective treatment for people suffering with borderline personality disorder. And this was a group of people who at that point had been considered untreatable and beyond hope, and they were given hope. Most recently, DBT has been shown to be an effective approach for people with multiple problems that have not responded to other treatments and are complex, regardless of diagnosis. So decades ago, when Dr. Linhan first started her work on DBT, she cast a stone into the water, and the ripples have been expanding ever since. Today, it's not an exaggeration by any means to say that her work has brought millions back from the brink of suicide. It's helped them to find freedom from their suffering and given them a life where joy is possible. Dr. Linehan and her colleagues trained me as a DBT therapist and trainer over 15 years ago. It was a significant turning point in my life and in my career. Since that time, her work has made it possible for me to help many people who were beyond my capabilities before DBT. Many of their stories, oh, excuse me, many, uh, and I've also trained hundreds of clinicians in DBT, and many of their stories are similar to mine. So if DBT is indeed diabolical at all, it's because if you stay with it, okay, it works its way into your life and into your very being. Dr. Linehan's work has not only made me a better therapist, a better teacher, a better trainer, it's also made me a better husband and father and friend. So it's with a deep gasho, a heartfelt personal thanks, and a very warm welcome, I give you Marsha Linehan. Yeah. Well, I'm coming back here to get a talk like that. That's really great. I do have to say, too, I am so impressed with Fan. I have to start with that. This does not count in my minutes, just to let you know. Um, the thing that's so stunning about Fan, from my point of view, is that it's an educational group that's not trying to make money for itself. This I consider very rare. You probably do, too. And the very fact that someone put this much effort into something but not be trying to get its own money to do other things, I'm impressed with. The other thing, I'm, I'm going to hire her because I have never met anybody who could find that many people to support their work. <laughs> and this means that one, she's good, two, the work must be valuable because I figure people who give loads of money are usually pretty smart and therefore they're probably not giving loads of money to junk. So I'm impressed, really impressed. And so, and I feel, you know, I want to come back the next time when you say my name, when you read those names, you know. And so that'll be good too.
Okay. So uh, I do have to say that part of what I was going to say has already been said, but so I hope you don't mind reminding, getting it twice. I also have to tell you just ahead of time that I may have to practice my radical acceptance skills because on the way here, um, I was putting together the final stuff on my talk and it consistently about every three minutes told me that it no longer worked on the computer and went off, and then I got it on, and then I got it off, and then I got it on. And a few minutes ago, before we did this, the whole thing went down. So I'm thinking maybe, you know, 30 years is long enough for a computer. <laughs> <laughs> it just goes to show how thrifty I am. <laughs> Okie dokie. So I'm going to talk to you about dialectical behavior therapy, and I'm going to talk to you about, you know, a little bit what it is, uh, but not too much, because I found out that there are loads of therapists here who already know the treatment. I was told ahead of time, don't bore everybody telling them what the treatment is again. So I figure, okay, I'll tell you a little bit. But I'm going to tell you what we're doing, what the newest of the new is, what's exciting, and the most fabulous stuff my computer would not put on the computer, so I'll just tell you all about it. But it, actually, the ending is going to be the most exciting, just to let you know ahead of time. <laughs> And we're just going to pray the whole thing works. But don't worry, I can talk without a computer, <laughs> as everyone points out. Now, you need to know my disclosures because, you know, you have to, I receive grant funding from the National Institute of Mental Health. Uh, I receive training and consultation fees from Behavioral Tech, uh, I, uh, which is a training company, which I founded but don't own. I receive compensation, however, from Behavioral Tech Research, which I founded and I do own it. And I receive compensation um, from uh, royalties on my books. And I receive payment for, for research presentations like this one. So to be perfectly honest, you have to take with a grain of salt most of what I have said. <laughs> How did DBT get doing? This you already know because you heard it. What happened was, I was, uh, for, most people don't know this, for many, many years, I was the only researcher in the United States doing randomized clinical trials to develop and evaluate suicide treatments. Great Britain and, and Europe has actually had quite a, always had a fair amount of this research. The United States had very little of it. And I started, and I, no one believed in behavior therapy more than me. I was, I was Freudian and get converted to behavior therapy. And I just figured I would show that it worked. I, ha, I was not a very good scientist at the time, because no scientists do stuff like that. You're supposed to find out if it works. But I was not worried about finding out. I figured I already knew the answer. That absolutely, it would work. And uh, most of my talks uh, start out with success through failure. And the reason they start that way is nothing could have been worse than behavior therapy. It was a, just a total disaster because it was a change-oriented treatment in those days. This is back in the 1970s. So it's, everything's changed since then. But back then, change was the way to go. And um, so I ended up developing a treatment primarily because behavior therapy failed. And uh, a pure acceptance therapy failed even worse because people said, aren't you going to help me? And I said, oh, yes, of course I'm going to help you. So I'm not going to go too much into this because many of you probably already heard the story of how DBT got developed. But basically what happened was at every single step, Something failed and I had to solve it. Something failed and I had to solve it. Something failed. So I'm the perfect example that, of not giving up when your treatment fails and you fail developing it. And I tell my students all the time, just keep going. So, but it was high risk for suicidal behavior that my heart was set on and the idea was to get people out of hell. And a person who wants to be dead, one can think of them as already in hell. And what they're trying to do is to get out of hell. And my job is to climb down with them and, and get them out. I don't bring them out. I get behind them and teach them how to walk the steps out of hell. Okay, so I consider sort of teaching people how to climb a ladder. So uh, it started out that way, and all the research for a long time, and everybody thought that's all we taught, with, treated with suicide. But then we started treating borderline personality disorder and high suicidality. Borderline personality disorder is multiple disorders. Um, then we started treating multi, uh, uh, by 
uh, borderline personality disorder, and we did research on substance dependence. I'll give you the results later. Uh, then we, I moved to borderline personality disorder and heroin addiction. And I, I, hearing all the unbelievable number of deaths with heroin addiction, I'm thinking of going back and trying to grab some money from somebody in, at that government and, get, and telling them, okay, we need to do another study with the heroin addicts because they're all back on their heroin again. And then we did um, uh, borderline personality disorder plus um, trauma, which is post-traumatic stress disorder. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about that later because that's in our newest of our new uh, stuff. And um, DBT has been looked at in multiple reg axis one disorders, particularly that DBT is not a treatment that you really need if you don't have a very serious disorder. If you have a disorder that you can take a pill for, you don't really need DBT. Not that I know treatments the pills actually work for very well, other than psychosis, which it does work for. Uh, but generally, um, a, a, a minor or sort of not really serious disorder, there'd be no reason for DBT. Uh, DBT is really for your severe, difficult to treat, multiple disorder. And we treat all the people that nobody else wants to treat. And believe me, you're, I'm going to talk to you later about the fact there's so many people unwilling to treat the people we treat. We've looked at high risk for... Um, uh, high-risk adolescents, this study, we're just this minute finishing. Literally, we got our last patient through just a couple of days ago. Uh, we've done DBT with college students and high school students. Uh, these are people, the college students were people who, you know how college students are, they drink a lot, okay? <laughs> and um, especially at the beginning when they come in. It does go down by the time they get out but they start out with a lot of alcohol. So we did a study on college students who drink to regulate their emotions. So they drink mainly to feel better, okay? And, and the treatment was remarkably effective. It was short. It had the DB, dialectical behavior therapy skills, which I'm going to talk about later, but it was remarkably effective. And um, it's also been very effective in a school system, the school system is not a randomized trial, so you can't say really that DBT changed it, but I will tell you just because it is promise and one of our future things we're going to do is get out there in the school system and get this stuff in there, mainly because there was a school that had very high rate of suicide. Their, their teenagers had a very high rate of suicide for about six or seven years. And they say, we've got to do something. So they decided to take dialectical behavior therapy skills and put it into the school system. And they um, kind of looked at what kids were having some sort of difficulty. So it was sort of like a prevention idea. And they kept that going for over uh, seven years. I think it's eight now. That means it's sustainable as a treatment. And they had zero suicides after putting it in. Now, do not take that as causal because you have to have a randomized trial. So it could have been, you know, accidental or, or some other reason. But it means that that's a study that's begging to be done. And then we run a whole friends and family group in our clinic. And, um, and what we, these are friends, almost always friends and family who have family members who will not get treatment usually. And they come in and ask us to change the person who won't get treatment, which we absolutely refuse to do, but we tell them we'll help change them. And if you change, they'll change. And in general, that's probably true. So we run a friends and family. And so the reason I'm telling you this is DBT is absolutely going out to the population who don't have mental disorders. So I'll talk about a little bit, a, a little bit more later. Now, I had to be nervous every time I changed this because when I changed it on the in the plane, it would always quit. So if it does, I'll keep going. Okay, why do we select borderline personality disorder? In my very first study, I, had, I was treating about, I never heard of borderline personality disorder. Okay, so I had no idea that's who I was teaching, treating. Okay, so I developed an entire treatment without knowing what the disorder was I was treating, but they were all suicidal. So what's good about them? What's great about them? They have the highest suicide risk. Okay, so we love them. <laughs> and they're out of control most of the time. We really love them. 
and they're very difficult to treat. They call you, they burn out therapists and all that stuff. We love them, okay? <laughs> so they're perfect for us because I don't have too much interest in dealing with the easy to deal with problems. I have a big interest in the really difficult problems. And I've managed to get all my graduate students just as excited as me. <laughs> so that's why they're the highest risk. So no matter who we've looked at, we're looking for high risk people. And this just happens to be, I hope there aren't too many people in the room with this disorder if you didn't know this, but I'm, you can get better, that's for sure. But they're very high risk people. Okay. So. Um, so let me just say a minute what dialectical behavior therapy is. It's a comprehensive treatment. In other words, it, it covers uh, um, all the aspects of treatment that you need. It's not a small treatment where you have to then also have some other psychotherapists involved. Uh, it's, just, it's modular. This is going to be really important when I get towards the end and talk about our current computerized treatments now which are really based on the idea that uh, you can take a modular treatment and put it in a computer, as it turns out. And I apparently, according, I have a graduate student who has a PhD in computer science. She's a psychologist, but she also has that. She told me, she says, you think just like a computer thinks, Marcia. So I'm not sure if that's good or bad, but um, apparently it must be true. She would know. Um, and so it's, it's multi-diagnostic, as I said. The Corcoran um, uh, uh, collaborator uh, group, this is the international group that looks at everybody's treatments, okay? And that international group have said the DBT is the only treatment that has sufficient evidence for the treatment of borderline personality disorder. It doesn't mean that everyone else doesn't have studies that show it works. But to really show a treatment works, you have to be able to replicate it with people who are not the treatment developer. And DBT is one of the few treatments that I have spent an enormous amount of my life getting other people to do research on DBT to make sure that we could duplicate it and other universities could duplicate it, other places could duplicate it, et cetera. And I'll talk about that in a minute. And so, although there were battles constantly at the beginning, it's like, this only works because Marshall enhanced the therapist. This doesn't treat symptoms. This only treats symptoms. Not that behaviors don't have the concept of symptom in the first place. That's a medical idea. So I kept saying, I said, I don't have to treat it. You know, I don't believe in the concept in the first place. But it turns out that we, we did a study every time someone disagreed. The next thing they disagreed with was they said, this only works because all good therapies work. You, you work just like everybody else. So we, I've done a study every time. You know, when they, someone criticizes, I say, okay, give me a measure, I'll do the study. If I can show that I can change it, I, you will be quiet. <laughs> and everybody to this day is not only be quiet, but in one place they stood up and clapped. Okay, <laughs> so there's really no disagreement now. There was for years, it was a battle, believe me, for years, but it's no battle now. Okay, so I'm gonna go through some of the things that are definitional. Of course, obviously, it's that word dialectical. <laughs> and I'm not going to go into a whole definition of what dialectical is, but I am going to tell you a couple of little points about it so that you could be dialectical yourself, okay? Dialectics is when you bring together opposites. You're always looking for the synthesis. How do things go together, okay? So I could ask you, you know, what's the dialectic of black and white? You put black and white together. If you mix them up together, what, what, what happens? Almost everyone, I guarantee you, will tell you it would be gray. If you put black and white together, you'd have the color gray. But actually, if you put black and white together and you're dialectical, you would have a plaid. Okay, so in other words, it's where you're not getting rid of one side and the other side. You're not, you're not compromising what you think. You're bringing together and you're always looking for what is left out of my understanding of what's happening. You know, and how is it that, that things change? Dialectic's all about change, and it basically has got the idea that everything's always changing, and it's the change in transaction. So it's not interactional therapy theory, it's transactional, 
which is if I change, you change. Like you all are all changing me because you're sitting there watching me and having reactions. And I'm changing you because I'm talking about this. And it's a transaction that's always going on. And DBT therapists are always looking for where's the transaction and always looking for what's left out, what is missing, how can I bring these things together, where can we fit, and it's, therefore, there, it, it, from a dialectical point of view, there's no absolute truth, nor is there relative truth. Okay, so you can think about that for a while. <laughs> so, what happened was, I had to bring together behavior therapy, which is change strategies, and I had to bring together acceptance strategies. The way I ended up as Zen Master was that I discovered when I wanted to do acceptance strategies that I myself was not doing a great job at acceptance. And at this point in the game, mindfulness was not in any psychotherapy. Not the first, DBT is the first therapy that put my, uh, mindfulness into a psychotherapy. John Kabat-Zinn was the first person who put it into a medical treatment. And so uh, what happened was I realized that it was hard to, you can't teach acceptance if you can't do it. So I uh, fortunately had been trained as a spiritual director, a, a Christian spiritual director, a good Catholic that I am. And so um, I had to figure out how to learn acceptance. And so I knew I didn't know how. So I called the people who trained me as a spiritual director and said, I figure I might as well go the best. I said, who's the best in the world? Who are the best teachers in the world? And two names came down. One was uh, a, a Buddhist monastery in California that was run by a woman, and the other was a Benedictine monk. So I had to decide, was I Catholic or was I a woman? <laughs> so I went to the woman first. <laughs> and let me tell you, I in my lifetime, it, it was like being in the womb or something. I've never been in such a non-sexist environment in my entire life. So that was really wonderful, and I immediately realized that I, I had found what I was looking for to teach. It was one of the most wonderful experiences of that, that's, all, all of my work comes from there. But then I also went to the Benedictine monk, and sure enough, it turned out he was a Zen master himself. I thought, oh my God, I didn't even know you could do that when you're a Catholic, but it turns out you can. <laughs> Although he's on kind of all the no-admit lists to the Catholic Church, I have to admit. <laughs> As he says on his website, they told me not to say anything, but I chose to ignore them. So, and they can't do much because he's too famous, one of the best known, biggest mystics and Zen teachers in Europe. So they had to be careful. And of course I'm careful, and of course he is Catholic, and I am Catholic, and I'm Zen, and he is Zen. So that should be hopeful to others. <laughs> so I had to put those two together, which I did. Um, then the problem was that I discovered that the clients didn't have any ability to accept or tolerate they didn't really have the ability to tolerate distress. And at that time, there's no research on distress tolerance. It, you know, it's all over the place now, but there was nowhere then. So I had to learn how to do that too. So I developed a whole set of skills. And so I just, I have to, there's change skills, and then there are acceptance skills. Change or how do you change things that need to be changed? And I'll talk a little bit more about them when I tell you about our latest of our late on skills. And acceptance skills are mindfulness skills, but they're mindfulness skills coming out of Zen. So they're the mindfulness, you know, sort of what do you do, which is observing, how do you do it, which is in the moment, non-judgmentally, etc. So there's a lot of skills in there. Um, and it almost all comes mainly out of Zen and what my Zen teacher taught me. Okay, so I, I pretty much just took what he taught me and redid it and made it into skills. So those are the skills. The other thing that's balanced was at the time, people had four, five, six, seven, eight mental disorders that were, they were diagnosed with. So my problem was, how did, how did I teach therapists how to manage this? In other words, what should you pay attention to when? So what I had to develop was a, a target-based agenda, which boils down to, you really do have to pay attention to keep them alive first. 
Okay, so you had to get behavior under control, and in behavior under control, the first thing has to be keeping them alive, because therapy, I guarantee you, does not work for dead people. <laughs> and so you have to convince the client of that. The average client actually thinks, it's really amazing, but they actually think they're gonna feel better if they're dead. And I point out to them there's zero data <laughs> on that. <laughs> But they almost always believe it. It takes a while for me to convince them that they could be wrong. There's one whole religion that says that if you kill yourself, you have to come back and start your life over. And I tell my pay, I say, listen, if anything would make me not do it, that's it. <laughs> so think about it. So we have to keep them alive. On the other hand, and so we have diaries and things like that, and people come in with diaries, and we're tracking their behavior every week or every, between every session. So we're tracking all the time what they've done and what they're doing. And then we, each session is aimed at the problem behavior since the last time, okay? And then at the same time, we have a whole nother part of the treatment that's the DBT skills training. And skills training is protocol based, meaning that when you come this week, you're learning the skills we're teaching this week. We have never been able to find that you could figure out that one skill would be better for someone and that they needed this skill instead of that skill. We've never been able to match skills to the problems of clients. Our experience has been almost everybody does best if they get them, almost all of them, okay? So that's that. Then, um, oh, the next thing that happened was we discovered, you know, there's a real difference in, um, there's a real belief by behaviorists, in, that includes me, that we're obligated to give clients evidence-based treatments. That if a person thinks they're getting um, treatment acts, that treatment acts should have data that it actually works. And that if it has no data, at a minimum, you should tell clients you're giving them and experimental treatment, okay? In the sense that nobody gives you drugs that haven't been tested, for example. Nobody gets that. This, the, you, people don't let you have it. And if you get it, they have to tell you that it's experimental. This is a real failure in all of the mental health treatments, as far as I know, all the psychotherapies, is the uh, people are very willing to do treatments that have zero data, okay? So that's on the one hand. Okay, so we're talking dialectics now. So does that mean they have to be rigid? You can never change anything, you can never do anything, you can never fit anything to the problems that you've got? No. So what you have to do is go buy the book. In other words, not buy it, like get the, pay money for it. I mean, you have to teach from the treatment itself. In other words, stay within the principles, and DBT is a principle-based treatment, which is good because it doesn't tell you most of the time what to do. It tells you what principle to use to decide what to do. So you have to stay in the principles, but you also have to make adaptations. So I'm gonna go right through a few adaptations that we've made just to give you an idea. Because what we don't wanna do is tell people, oh, you can't adapt it, you can't do anything to it, okay? And particularly for cultures, you're gonna to have to do some adaptation. For example, we just have something, I, th I think it's in press, on Native Americans. So we had to change some of the mindfulness with Native Americans to use some of their Native American mindfulness practices that were not, definitely not in DBT when I wrote DBT because I knew nothing about their practices. But now we've got them in there. So what else? Um, Adolescents, you're gonna to have to change your treatment. You can't treat adolescents identical to adults. You can use all the same skills, by the way, in case you think that these are, you know, that adolescents, that the skills are too sophisticated for adolescents. Let me tell you, I ran the adolescent training program and adolescents understood skills five times faster than their parents. <laughs> I'm not kidding, they did. They would, the, the kids would explain to the parents what the skills were. I was shocked because everybody all kept saying you have to dumb them down, make them easier, all that kind of stuff. So. I wouldn't advise that, okay? But there are a lot of other things that are different. For example, when you're treating an adolescent, you're going to have their parents involved. And the adolescent who's highly suicidal, you've got to get the parents, and in skills training, the parents are all in all the skills training 
with the adolescents. So just as an aside, what do you think? If you asked an adolescent what would be their favorite skill, what do you think it would be? Just let your mind go for a minute. Don't yell out, okay? All right, so I'll tell you the answer. Kids will tell you radical acceptance is their favorite skill. Why? I am sure it's because kids have to radically accept a lot. Okay, But then if you ask them, what do you want me to teach? It is not radical acceptance. They want you to teach validation. So I say, oh, does that mean that you want your parents to be more validating? I say, they say, right. I say, usually, I say, look, you want your parents to validate you? You're going to have to learn to validate them. Okay, So we, we teach them how to do rewarding, too. And I say, look, you need to learn how to reward your parents to get what you want. You know, you need to use this, all this power of what you're learning here to use it on your parents because we're teaching them how to use it on you. So, um, so there are a lot of changes that have to be made. I'm not going to go through every one of these. I might run out of time. With substance dependence, really interesting group, okay? So highly suicidal people, in general, are somewhat attacked. Their community, in many ways, becomes the mental health community. And therefore, if you want to reinforce them, you can give them an extra session and an extra phone call, okay? With drug addicts, it's exactly the opposite. They've got all their friends in the drug world. So if you want to reinforce them, you tell them, okay, you don't have to come to this session and you don't have to talk to me on the phone. Okay. So you really have to know a lot of the differences. Now, the other thing that I'm very excited, and some, a lot of you may not know about this unless you have the new book, the book with all of the new skills in it, which is we, I developed an entire set of addiction skills. And the addiction skills are you use with people who have addictions. Now, I have a whole page in the new skills book. I'm not trying to sell it to you, but unfortunately, you probably have to look at it to get all this. But... Um, the, the thing that was really interesting about it was I made a whole page up that starts out with in case you thought you weren't addicted, okay? And it's got every single thing that you could be addicted to. So it turns out that you, it's not 100% clear that a lot of us aren't actually addicted. It turns out that sometimes we're addicted and we just don't admit it. So anyway, we have a really good set of addiction skills. And right now, one of my grad students and I, we're developing an online, so I'm going to get to this later, but I can't bear not to tell you. <laughs> this is very exciting because we're doing an online treatment for alcoholics who are suicidal. It turns out, given that my grad student is so fabulous that she's done all this research, she found out that the higher, it, with every step up in suicide ideation, the uh, alcoholic person is less preferring to come to a psychotherapist. But they're very willing to come to, guess what, a computerized treatment. So I'm going to talk about that later, because you might be thinking computerized treatments don't work, but I will convince you before you leave that that is not true. However, the next thing that we had to deal with and this is, I'm talking about this really because I, some people, you know, I wanted to be able to say things that might be new uh, or that you might not know about. And um, what happened in my first treatment manual was that we had so many people with post-traumatic stress disorder, but the problem with them was, was that you had to be very careful in the treatments that are available, which mainly is exposure treatments, because the clients can get overwhelmed with emotions. In other words, if they can't regulate their emotions, they get out of control. That does not mean that you can't do post-traumatic stress treatment. But what it did mean was everybody thought that's what I was saying. And therefore, almost everyone quit doing treatment for post-traumatic stress disorder, which is really a problem. So I and one of my senior scientists in my center, we got together to work on how can you safely do this, okay? And that's the key, safely doing it. And the key is to get people to, to ignore all those things I said that scare them to death, okay? So that's why I'm talking. So pay attention to what I'm saying here and ignore what you think I said there, okay, in the book. <laughs> so what happened was, and we knew it was a problem, and the problem was, if you look at this data, this is just one of our studies. 
where we were looking at how well did we did with substance dependence. We brought seven, we get, got remission in 87% of the people who had substance dependence. Now, that is not a minor finding. However, look over at the anxiety disorders. Those look like, they, on depression, by the way, there is no treatment better than DBT for depression. Okay, but then go over to anxiety disorders, it was a disaster. Why? Because we know we have better treatments than those. This is not a good outcome compared to the outcome that we should have had. And what we realized was, was that we were not really going full step ahead with exposure treatments because we were worried about how the clients were going to react, okay? So that's when we realized that we had to come up with a new way to do this. So we did. This is one of the saddest things I have to say about. Really, this is sad, I got to tell you. Okay, what happened was we took our clients who came in and we told them, if you will quit trying to kill yourself and quit harming your body, we will give you a treatment that works. And sure enough, they quit and we gave them the treatment and it worked. Now that is sad. What is sad about that? Why wasn't anybody else saying we'll give you a treatment that works? How was it that it had to be us that was telling them that? So this is contingency management with exposure protocol. And if during the exposure they quit, they start harming themselves or trying to kill themselves, we would just stop the treatment and say, okay, we're back to the other. When that's gone, we'll give you the treatment again. And although the treatment's unbelievably painful, every one of them want to get over post-traumatic stress disorder and flashbacks. So we had ex we've had extremely good outcomes with those. So that's the latest of the light. You'll have to get to, you can, we have, and it's, it, there's some publications um, on this. Okay, the next thing that happened to us was, um, Okay, this is a place where my computer messed up. Okay, well, I can tell you everything, all the problems. Okay, so here's what happened. Um, we've discovered DBT is so wanted that you can, let me just check. I'm gonna practice here. Okay, I'm going through how what good the treatment is, but you already know that, so we'll skip it. Um, let me, I'm gonna come back to that, I think it's later. Okay, can anyone besides me do this treatment? That was the key issue for years, with the main criticism. So there've been 17 randomized controlled trials by other people. So that answers that question, because they all had good results. So it means this is not something related to me personally. That's really critical. You never want that to be the case. Um, and then people said, well, it's just expert therapy. So we did that research and found out that's not true. We compared DBT to expert psychotherapists. We got all the top clinics in Seattle to nominate the best therapists in Seattle. And then we said to them, would you be willing to be a therapist? In our study, you've been nominated as an expert therapist in Seattle. So of course they all said yes. We eliminated all the behavior therapists. Okay, so none of them were behavior therapists. But you see here what the findings were. We had 50% fewer suicide attempts, 53%. You can read this, you can see this. So there's no really doubt about it. That's the, well, the interest is that you can't say the findings are from uh, just us or just because it's good therapy. Uh, so the answer there is no. Now, the other thing um, to note, this is called, this is my what news section. Um, I spent 11 years on the new DBT skills book. And I just want to tell those of you who get it to remember that you, once you get the book, you can download everything else for free. In other words, don't buy two books, only buy one. <laughs> because when you get the treatment manual, you can download all the treatment um, skills and you don't have to buy the second book, okay? But everybody seems to think you do, but you don't. And you can download all the teaching notes and take them in with you when you teach. So in other words, once you get it, you can download everything. And you can give the teaching notes to your clients. 
And why would I suggest something like that? Because this is the latest of the late. This is the DBT, I think this is the name of it, I'm not sure, but I think it's DBT Skills Manual, maybe Skills Training Manual, something like that. It's got my name on it, so you can find it. <laughs> now, here's the deal. I thought that the book would be too overwhelming for therapists, because it has practically every idea I've ever had <laughs> in it. And so I was worried therapists wouldn't be able to use it. So you can imagine my surprise when two things happen. First, I had previous clients calling me up to say how wonderful it was that they were now really, they now believed in the skills they hadn't before, but now I'd made it all clear. And it turns out that clients love it. So if you get it for teaching, uh, there's nothing in the book that tells you to do this because I didn't think it was true. But you can give it to your clients. Okay, so that's one. Second, my sister calls me up. My sister, who's two years younger than me. My sister lives in New York, plays golf with her friends. She calls me up to say, you have transformed my life. And I said, well, how did I do that? She said, well, me and all my girlfriends that I play golf with, we have a study group now, and we're all learning the skills and practicing them. Okay? So then I have another person come in who's in a consultation. He walks in and says, boy, you know, I'm really, me and my girlfriend, we're learning the skills. I said, really, who's teaching them? What the, I didn't even know, is there a skills group in Seattle that you're with? He said, oh, no, we're learning it from the book. So the reason I'm telling you about that is, I, it may sound like I'm trying to sell the book, but what I'm really trying to do is tell you that those of you who are getting it, work with the people that you're working with. It turns out that our clients can also use it. And you don't have, they don't have to buy the book. You can print the book out for them. Um, and just give them what you print out. So they don't need to go buy it because you can print it out as many times as you want to from Guilford, the Guilford Press. So it's all set up so that people can get, get everything. So the, um, there are a lot of new skills in there. Um, and the reason it took me 11 years to write it was because the, I had to keep up with all the research, and a lot of the research didn't come out until later. And so um, for those of you who don't know what the skills are, let me tell you what the groups of skills are, okay? So it always starts with... Um, it starts with a set of skills which are uh, therapeutic, to things that therapists do, actually. But I turned them into skills. And so there's one on how to analyze, if you have a problematic behavior, what prompted it, what led up to it, and what the consequences were, so that you can figure out how to change the behavior. And then I have another one that's called missing links, OK? So, Missing links is how to analyze when a behavior that's expected or wanted is not there. Now, the way that ended up a skill was I was teaching in, when I had adolescents and their parents. And one of the parents had not done their homework. We always analyze how you didn't do your homework. So then what happened was I said to the mother's child, daughter, I said, you know, why don't you analyze your mother instead of me? And I'll coach you. So I did. I coached her through the whole thing. And then the mother said, I want to know how to do that right away. How'd you do it? I said. So I thought, oh, OK, I'll make that into a skill. So it's in the book. It's a skill now. And it's how do you analyze behavior that's not there, OK? And then how do you change it? I mean, how do you get it to be there in the future? So that, it's a very short, but it's logical, but it's there. And so you can find that. And that's one of the new things that's in. There's a lot of other new things that are in there. So what I want to talk for a moment about, and this is new research for most of you, is how important are the skills? Okay, so for those of you who don't know DBT, I'll quickly tell you that DBT has several components, okay? So one component is individual psychotherapy, which a therapist gives, okay? So we have a therapist who would be trained in DBT therapy. They would do individual therapy, and they're the ones that check what's happened since last time I saw you, they figure out what is the core problem, how do you change the core problem, and how do you change all the behaviors run, that are controlling suicidal behavior or other difficult behaviors. Okay, so that's the individual therapy. Everyone is also in skills training, and in skills training, 
you go in and you learn a whole set of skills. And in a moment, I'm going to tell you what they are. And then um, we have uh, phone calls. All, DBT, in contrast to any other therapy that I know of, requires that therapists be available for phone calls, respecting their own uh, uh, lives. In other words, they, they can set up that, you know, I only talk on these days, I only talk on these days. But as we've always said, one of the reason therapists cause, I mean, the real reason for putting this in this therapy, to be honest with you, is my belief that it's unfair that psychotherapy, from my point of view, is the only relationship I know of where one person has that much control over the other person and when you can talk, particularly when something's gone wrong in the relationship. I mean, imagine how you would feel if your partner, your husband, or your daughter or something, and you had a battle, and you felt bad, and you were distressed, and you wanted to call them, and they said, I'm sorry, you can only call me on Fridays at 3, and then if I have time, I'll talk to you on Fridays. At, well, you could call between 3 and 3.15, otherwise you'll have to wait for two weeks or one week. I mean, none of us would like a person to treat us that way. But therapists do it all the time. So I'm against it, and I make up the rules because I developed the treatment. <laughs> That's the way it goes. And therefore, you have to observe your own limits. That's another thing that's required. So therapists have to observe. One of the reasons we have therapists take phone calls is because one of our jobs is to get our patients to interact in such a way that I want to talk to them. So, I mean, I have a client who hung up on me two times last week, and that means she can't call me for two weeks. Sorry, not two weeks, two days. Two days, okay. And I tell her when I see her, I say, you know, you, I don't want you to burn me out. I don't want to be burned out. I don't want you to burn me out. Let's talk about what you're doing that could have that effect on me because we don't want to have that happen to me. So it's not that we ignore the problems. It's just that we don't have arbitrary decisions based on the only fact that they are a mental patient, which I'm against. Okay. Um, almost everyone in the field of suicide is now come around to having the same policies I have. Okay, so that's uh, that. And then the final component of the treatment is the uh, team, therapist team. This is unique to DBT right at the moment. I don't think it'll stay unique, but it is now. And DBT requires that all therapists be on a team of at least two people. Generally, it's much more than that. And the job of a team is that it's therapy for the therapist by the therapist. In other words, the therapists are helping the, the therapy. Each therapist is helping other therapists change their behavior or improve their behavior or monitor their behavior to be sure that they stay inside the treatment and also that they're doing the best therapy available, okay? And so you can't any, I'll just tell you this, if you know anyone who says they're doing DBT who's not on a team, they're not doing DBT. It is a required part of the treatment. Now, people can do it by Skype. They can do it in different ways, but they have to have a team. And we um, had the University of Washington lawyers who did an entire analysis of the law in every way, which way that said that you were completely covered um, once you were identified as a therapist, I mean, as a, a being treated yourself. And what you're being treated to is how to do better therapy. So that's required. And to get into one of the teams, not only do you have to accept that all therapists are jerks, because most of us really are. We do most of the terrible things our patients said we did. So you have to agree ahead of time that you will admit to that. <laughs> and uh, you also have to agree, this is the most important thing you have to agree to. You have to agree that if on your team, even one person has a patient who commits suicide, for the rest of your life, if anybody ever asks you, have you had a patient kill themselves, you will have to say yes. You may not say no. And you can't get on team without agreeing to that. Now, there are a bunch of other agreements, but that's that. Okay. So, the, um, what I want to tell you is what happened with skills. So I'm going to skip a few things. These are the skills. We have mindfulness skills. We have distress tolerance skills. We have emotional regulation skills. And, um, in the, uh, and we have interpersonal skills. I don't, I'm not sure. Oh, they're up there. So you have interpersonal skills. 
which is how to get what you want and maintain relationships at the same time, which is not a bad thing to be able to do, and keep your self-respect. I had a, was writing a book on this, and, an author, and the editors refused to publish it, saying um, self-respect and moral values are not scientific, so we won't put it in your book. So I said, fine, you don't have to publish it then, which they didn't. But I put it in my own books. So we have mindfulness, um, distress tolerance, emotion regulation, and interpersonal skills. And now we have sort of off on the side special skills, which are our addiction skills. And we have special addiction skills also for alcohol. Now we just, just realized we just developed a new skill, which you'll hear about at some point about two weeks ago. That's when we found out that trying to get alcoholics always to be abstinent is not a good idea. So that was a shock, but we made up a great skill. Okay, so these are the DBT skills book. I'll skip that. So does DBT increase skills use? That's the first question, because if you can't show that people do more of the skills, you can't, I mean, what's the point? So we, of course, researched that and found out that this orange thing up there is people in DBT. And what you see is that everybody, uh, all the people in DBT skills went up, but you also see that the control condition also used more skills, because we had a measure of skills that didn't use any terminology that we use in teaching them. The important thing to look at is that in follow-up, people in DBT were still using skills, and the control condition was not. So that's the actual important point of this, okay? The next is, does it mediate outcomes? Mediating outcomes means, can we show that if you use the skill, an outcome changes? That doesn't change if you haven't used the skill, okay? So it has to do with time, okay? So what did we find out? We found out that it mediates. It mediates suicide attempts. In other words, using skills makes you less likely to attempt skill, suicide, Non-suicidal injury goes down, depression goes down, anxiety goes down, anger control goes up, emotional regulation goes up, and interpersonal problems are better. In other words, what we're finding over and over and over is a huge part of the treatment appears to be skills, far more than any of us thought, okay? Um, now, is it a necessary component? Um, I'm going to skip that part. What I'm going to say is the following. I'm going to say something to all of you who've read the research. We looked at a study where we took skills out and put them in, and we moved them around. So what we found was that there was no significant difference between... Th that, in fact, when you did individual therapy without skills, there was no significant difference in outcomes compared to doing skills alone. Okay, so that's one thing. So that has been misinterpreted by just about everyone as saying that they're equal, that you don't need the standard treatment, okay? But the facts are we didn't do a study to look at that. So what's really important for the therapist in the room to recognize is when you look at follow-up, you find that in follow-up, the people who had the standard DBT, which means you got individual therapy plus skills, had, had fewer, had clinically important fewer suicide attempts, okay? So we didn't have a big enough study. What we have to do is pull ourselves together and get enough to do another big study because it's really made a lot of people think that they don't need the individual therapy part. Now, the facts are there's another study in Canada where they looked at skills on the waiting list, and it may, compared to a waiting list without skills, the waiting list with skills, suicide attempts went down. But we know that skills reduce the probability of suicide attempts. It's just that you can reduce it more, particularly in follow-up, if you do the whole thing. So I want to, we're having to clarify this everywhere in the world. Um, so where are we going? One thing we want to do is conduct research on that. We, Right now, we're, all, we're also wanting to do research on alcohol, uh, and mainly because there's not one single study that's ever been done looking at the treatment of alcoholics who are uh, suicidal. I think that's really stunning. I was shocked when I found this out. So we said, okay, fine, we'll do it. So we're submitting something soon to the federal government. But 
where are we now current problems to solve? What are the problems that we have? First, before I do this, only because if I don't have time, I can't miss this. I have to tell you, our most fabulous. Okay, now you're the first to know. I'm not kidding. Other than my lab. Nobody else knows this. However, since we're going to present it in three days, you can find it out there, but I'm going to tell you, because it's so unbelievably exciting. I can hardly believe it myself. Okay. Any of, anybody who's read anything I've said knows that DBT does not hospitalize compared to anyone else. In every study we've ever done, we are significantly less likely to hospitalize someone than other treatments. And DBT is never believed in hospitalization. In case you, don't, you think there's data that hospitalization is a good idea for suicidal people, just in case you're thinking that, let me remind you, there's zero data of that. Zero. Zero. Not one single study has ever shown that locking people up or putting people in the hospital when they're suicidal has kept anyone alive for five extra minutes. There's not one single study, okay? And the highest risk for suicide is the day you get out of a hospital and the next four weeks, okay? So a lot of people say, oh, well, that's because you're suicidal before you went in. But that's what people think, but it could be not be true. So we have always not hospitalized. We, it's not that we never do, by the way. I'm willing occasionally. But our new study, one of my new fabulous graduate students did this. He said, um, because we have been saying all along that hospitalization may be iatrogenic. That means it may be actually harmful. So he decided to look at it. So what we found was, if you looked at how people were at before they went into treatment at all, the number of suicide attempts you had before predicted nothing. The amount of suicide ideation you had predicted higher rate of suicide attempts in follow-up. Okay, so that's pretty interesting, but doesn't address the question I'm interested in. So then we looked at the data during treatment, and it turned out that the more you were hospitalized during treatment, the higher the number of suicide attempts when you got out. So that made the same point that I've been making for years, which is putting people in hospitals could really be harmful. The next thing we found out was that DBT was not better than another treatment if you, if you didn't count the fact that they put them in hospitals. In other words, what made DBT have a lower suicide attempt rate was that it didn't hospitalize. So now we've got the data. This doesn't prove totally our point, but it does say we're ready to do a lot more research on that. This is one of the most important things. I mean, think of, think of all the people who get locked up and lose their liberty for being suicidal with zero evidence. I mean, how would you like to have someone just lock you up for something that has zero evidence? So, <clears throat> We're going to get the data. We're going to do the, I, My problem is that it's very hard to find anyone to do this research with me. Why? Because they're too afraid. So she's going to tell me to get off. So what am I going to tell you next? What's my most exciting new stuff? I have lots of exciting things. All my exciting things are at the end. That was the problem. OK. <clears throat> Okay, I'm going to have to take a couple of minutes here. The first thing I'm going to tell you, though, this is that there's a real disaster. The people saying they're doing DBT who have no training. This is all over the place now. And we're finding it constantly. Families are calling us. And what the treatment, they tell us what treatment they got, and it's not DBT. Why is that? You can make a fortune off of DBT. Everybody wants it. There's waiting lists all over the world. So we, have, we think we've got this solved. Because what we've done is that we have developed a certification program for DBT. And I and uh, Dr. Katie Corsland at the University of Washington, and we managed to get another group of people, and my brother donated a lot of money to us because I talked him into it. <laughs> and uh, thank God we wouldn't have been able to do it if he hadn't. And he came in, and we have now got certification up and running that you can be a certified DBT psychotherapist. 
And not only that, but we've developed something that you will be able to get international certification for the certifying group. So we've followed the international rules for how to develop a certification. And we only, we've got individual therapy now, we're going to start doing programs, and then we're going to move to certifying um, skills trainers. So all of you in the room who know DBT, get certified. Get yourself going on how to get certified. If you've learned the treatment, it's doable. If you haven't learned it, it's going to be hard. Okay, what, what else am I going to say? I'm going to tell you, I'm going to move down to my most exciting of exciting. Whoops, it's before thank you, though. Okay. <laughs> the other thing that we're doing that's probably the most exciting thing that I'm doing right now that I'm determined I'm going to do is this. Too many people cannot get treatment. They, they um, either can't get to treatment, um, they're phobic, they won't go, etc. So we've decided to develop computerized psychotherapy. Now, in case you think it doesn't work, there's an enormous amount of research on computerized treatment that it does work, usually as well as in person, if it's developed well. So we have developed already a DBT skills, computerized skills program for people with very high emotion dysregulation. In other words, people who can't regulate their own emotions. Generally, they have anxiety disorders and major depression. That treatment, which is a, uh, developed by myself and my, of course, brilliant graduate students, has very good outcomes, okay? The effect sizes, meaning the effect on improvement, is just as high as the identical study that another student did where it was done with psychotherapy, you know, human people. So we've got that up and running. We just have to get it. It's not ready to give to the public because we have to pull in the resources to, to deal with editing things. So, and a little voice tone work. Now, my other grad student, we're doing the one I told you about, which is looking at um, uh, developing online treatment for alcoholics who are suicidal, but probably any alcohol, we'll probably make it be an alcoholic, because alcoholics don't want to go to psychotherapy, it turns out, but they like online stuff. Then finally, I am in the process of talking to anybody who will listen to me and everybody who will talk to me about the fact that we are going to, and believe me, we're going to do this. We're going to develop an entire computerized, beginning to end, psychotherapy plus skills, DBT, computerized program. And, uh, you know, if they can get cars to drive themselves, we can get therapy to drive itself, okay? I mean, this is no more complicated, believe me, than that. And, um, so we're working on right now uh, getting that done, and let, so I'll end with a little story, which is why I'm so passionate about it. In the study, when we did the study with where we developed computerized treatment for people with very high dysregulated emotions, we decide, we excluded people with psychotic disorders. Remember, this was just a clinical trial. And so then we get this phone call from this mother who had found out about this. And she sobs on the phone with me and with uh, my graduate student. And she sobs with them, saying that it's not fair that we won't give it for her daughter because her daughter is psychotic and she can't be in groups. Because when she gets in groups, she's just too dysregulated and she can't learn anything. And so we went to human subjects, because of course it was research, so we had to get permission. We went to human subjects. Human subjects said, okay, you can give it to them. And they were just beyond thrilled. And I realized how many people in the world are like this. And if we can find something that people can, you know, find a URL, hit the button, and get their therapy, this will transform. And I'm telling you right now, just take it from me, this is the future. This is not something I've dreamed up that nobody's going to do besides me. There are other people who want to do it. What we have is an unbelievable good therapy to do it with because it's so the therapy itself fits into the logic of a computer. And can I just say two more sentences? Thank you. Okay. The other disaster that I'm going to tell you that's going on, that I hope some of you will do something about, because I'm telling you I can't change the entire world. Okay, but I can get you to do it. So here's the deal. P 
People cannot get DBT. They can't get it in any place in the world. Why? Because we can't get enough therapists. We've got places in Seattle that have ads out trying to get therapists. They can't get enough, okay? Why is that? Because DBT is primarily for the severe, okay? So what's going on in our training programs in the United States in particular, okay? In the United States in particular, we are fragilizing all of our grad students. We act like a grad student cannot take a high risk for suicide, patient who could end up in intensive care, might die, and so we put them in with these namby-pamby patients, sorry to say that, bad. Okay, we'll, we'll retract that, okay, and say, okay, don't, God, you gotta take that off the table, I'll sound really bad. The poor people with namby-pamby disorders, oh God, this is not good. Okay, see, I told you we're all jerks. I told you that before. <laughs> okay, I, I apologize for saying that. Actually, I do apologize for that. It was inappropriate and not uh, uh, too professional. But anyway, people with non-serious disorders. <laughs> okay, and uh, so they don't learn. So we have such unbelievable fear now of therapists at dealing with high risk for suicide people. Now, I'm here to tell you, I run a program this is why I haven't been able to have a sabbatical in 30 years or so, because I have all my students, we only treat extremely high risk for suicide, difficult to treat, multiple disorders. And my grad students are doing the treatment. I do treatment because they have to watch me do treatment every week, but other than that, they're doing all this treatment. Everyone in Seattle knows this graduate student's treating them. Everyone sends all their patients to us for the grad students to treat. And it's a wonderful training program. We're running a adult program, highly suicidal adults. We run an adolescent program. We have the adolescents and their parents, highly suicidal adolescents. We're running a friends and family program, which is for the parents, which I talked to you about earlier. And we're getting ready to start a program of parent training, particularly parent training of parents with suicidal children. Why? Because parents tend to reinforce their own child's suicidal behavior. So we want to really do a lot of work. This is needed because people do what they learn in graduate school. And so if we can't get this out into the universities, out into the training programs, and everywhere else, we're really going to stay at this level with no therapist to treat severe disorders except to lock them up in hospitals, which they get harmed in more than likely. So I want to really encourage I've put, I'm trying to develop right now, um, we're developing a new website because we have so many things we give away for free, so, and we want to give it away for free, so just to give you a little list so that you can find me. We have our, all of my lectures, we have all the courses I teach, we have all the exams we give to students, just everything you need to teach a program in your setting, we've got, and you can have it for free, okay? The other thing that I've done, and because my computer backed down, I couldn't give it to you, show it to you. I've spent a, 20 years or so trying to figure out how could we reduce the fear of psychotherapists. And so I realized that the fear was that if my client's suicidal, then I'm afraid I won't do something I'm supposed to have done, then I'll be sued. This is the main problem. So what I did was I have developed a what's called the Lenihan Suicide Safety Net. And those of you going to ABCT will hear about it. And um, what it is, it's a checklist that says, tells you, you must do an analysis of risk if this has happened. It tells you all the things that if they happen, you have to do that. You have to do an analysis. Then when it has analysis, it goes in the following way. It's a checklist. It goes, did, 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 did you do this? If you say yes, you get to keep going. If you say no, it says why not. And then, for your benefit, it gives you every good reason not to have done it. And you ha if you don't have one of those reasons, then you're in trouble and you have to do something. I once, right after I developed this whole thing, no less, I did it and I came up to something where I was supposed to have done something and I hadn't done it. So I had to go call my client up and say, Sorry, I forgot to ask you these questions. <laughs> and so it, even me, you know, failed in some of this. So it's all set up to give you what the main risk factors are for different types of people, you know, for genders, for ages, sexuality, that sort of thing. So it gives you all of that. 
and it's designed specifically to uh, get a therapist to believe that they can effectively work with a highly suicidal person. And just to let you know, that I'm not going to give his name, but it will be on it when we get it out the door. The lawyer who is the suicide lawyer in the United States, we sent it to him. We sent it to a zillion people. And he said, if someone uses this, I will tell everybody, don't bother suing. So it's a checklist. And it's designed to reduce your fear and guide you in things that you really do need to do. And so that will be out. And um, I will just put up and then shut up uh, my addresses. If you look me up at the University of Washington, you can find my website. And when you find my website, you find everything else I have. Um, you can also go to Linehan Institute, which was founded by me. It's not run by me, but it was founded by me. Uh, and they, have, they can give you information on how to get all these things also. But coming into the University of Washington, I don't have our new website up, but we just got a donation for a website. <laughs> so we're going to actually have a real nice website one of these days. And um, so look there for how to download things. And everything you can download from us is free. So I'm not sure if I went way over or a little bit over or not over, but I'm shutting up because I can tell over here that the boss has gotten close. Thank you.